What is going on, Grid Investors? Hey, today I've got a friend that's joined me um, and uh, Jeff, who I've just gotten to know today. So Bill Horan and I have known each other for several years. He is the CEO of Realty Exchange Corporation. And Jeff is actually his uh, his son and right, right-hand man that's been in the periphery of the business for quite some time, right? We're just chatting before hours uh, before we jumped on here that he's been or heard of, you know, been in the in the wings since the age of 13, right? And so as you guys know, what I like to do when I bring on somebody uh, new to the podcast is really get to learn about them, their business, why they started the business, what challenges they faced in the business, you know, and if, for those that don't know uh, what Realty Exchange is, it is uh, a 1031 tax exchange company. And Bill, you said you've been in the business how long now? How many years? 20, 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. So why don't we why don't we start with you? My longest job. I've Your ever long. Had. That's right. Well, actually, I never asked you what did you do, what did you do before that? What did you do before? I, I came out of telephone sales, right? And okay. so, um, you know, I started my career out of college selling. I got into the telephone business and dad kept saying, come in the business. I'm like, no, you're in that weird tax business. The government's going to kill it. Well, who the hell thought telephones would go away? And they did. <laughs> I used to sell big rooms of equipment, you know, everybody needed a big old box of phones and gone. So well, well, that's, phones that's... disappeared even long before 1031 exchanges. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, right? This is a, a family business. Right, Jeff would be third generation. You were second generation in it. Like, how did your dad get started in this business? Like, how did that yeah. come about? So, dad was a, a colonel, full colonel in the Air Force and retired. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I were here in Northern Virginia. So, he left Jersey, came here. And, like a lot of retired military guys, he went in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. He had a family friend uh, in Long and Foster. A guy named Herm Mefessel. He was one of the early guys with uh, Wes. And so he joined the Manassas office along in Foster. And that was in the terrible times when, you know, interest rates were 18% or stuff. And he didn't like the residential part, you know, pink bathrooms, all that kind of stuff. But he, and he was a comptroller when he retired from the Air Force. So he knew numbers mm -hmm. and Air Force's process and rules. Well, you know, this 1031 stuff fit right into that. So when this hit the street, that they were creating this role for the qualified intermediary, somebody gave him heads up to it. And he started learning about it right away. He has a good story where he went to a seminar down in um, Crystal City. Somebody from the West Coast had rolled through and was, you know, talking about 1031 exchanges. And the guy said, well, if you need documents, just call my office and get them. And dad said he ran home, called them. They faxed over documents, you know, to his fax machine, and he was in business. He went through and mocked them up, and that put him in business right off of a seminar. And, you know, he was retired military, so he was getting his pension, so he didn't have to worry about the day-to-day -day eating. So he mm. was the perfect guy to start a brand new business mm -hmm. in this weird tax thing, right? And he was very good at translating tax lingo. Right. You read tax code, it hurts, it's mm -hmm. painful, to English and putting it down to practical. So he was a real estate agent. So he had all of the day-to-day -day details, getting something, the closing, the listings, the deposits, all that process, and translated it to 1031. And how, how, long, the how, how long did it take him to get momentum in this? Because it sounds like... It was a couple of years before he got momentum. Right? Yeah. I would imagine was, it probably he, took some time. He started it in his bedroom. You know, wherever Green Country Club is, he, he, mm -hmm. started, he lived there and he started <laughs> it in his bedroom. He had a Macintosh computer, so his document looked pretty and a big old fax machine. And mom answered the phone. It was classic, small business, get the start. And he was competing with attorneys because the only people that did them before were attorneys. Interesting. But he, he had a simple process. He worked through process and he figured out to make it simple. Okay. So the business, uh, what well, sounded like it started, he started it right when 1031s. Oh yeah. Started. He started with the temporary. Well, 
the premise of a trade was out there for a long time. That's been out there since the 20s. But the mm -hmm. QI role, the middleman role, didn't start until 1990 is when the temporary regs came out. And that's when dad started the business. And then 91, they went final. So okay. he was actually at the very beginning. Yeah, he's one of the grandfathers of um, 1031. Interesting. Okay. So um, you were in the telephone business then. He'd right. been running it. He'd been running it for how long before he he, he finally convinced you? Ten years. Yeah. Okay. Ten years. Yeah. Who 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 did you work for? Out of curiosity. Uh, Executone, uh, GTE, and oh, then yeah. in the end, Nortel. Okay. And, and then I um, I can't think of the other company's name that I worked for, but you know the telephone business was just going through royal mess. That was back, you know, when you would go get a different telephone company, you know, all that stuff. It was, yeah. just, it was a mess, but okay. it's what we got today, right? Everything went to the cloud. So what, what year did you start? Oh man, what's 20 years from now, right? <laughs> so I, look back, I can't remember. I'm an old man. I can't remember that far back. Let's see, we're in, you know, what are we, 2020? So they're, I mean, 2022. So, yeah. you know, when was that? 92? 92? Uh, 82. No, it can't be 82. That's it can't, no. Yeah, it would have been, it would have been 90, it been 92, ago. 92, 94. Because that rings, a, that rings a bell to me. Because in 98, when I graduated college, we were still placing people for the Nortels of the world, sure. and the Windstars and all that. But then it was just, then it just kind of, they faded out after the dot-com kind of like implosion and all the rest. Right. So interesting. Okay. So let's just say 92, 94, somewhere around there. And, and Jeff, you were just what, 13 at the time? Is yeah. That right? Something like that. Yeah. I was still going through school. So the tax stuff definitely over my head. Right. And, uh, and you were like, what's that weird business that, that dad and, and grandpa are running? Right. Is exactly. That... Yeah. I understood telephones are the basics, but that didn't know anything about the tax law side of things. Right. And uh, it, uh, just a little family business over there. That's so, cool. And interesting to watch it. Well, the family business has grown quite a bit over the years, right? So let's talk a little bit about this. The last couple of years have been pretty crazy for you guys, right? Right. Like, the, the, it has been insane. I, I remember I was blown away when I talked to you and you were like, yeah, we, we do hundreds of 1031s every single month. And right. I was like, hundreds, right? right. And, and you're like, yeah, right, we, we do. And so I was like, okay, this is a, this is a for real business. Right. And, and what was interesting, oh, you thought I was fake before. No, no. But I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, you just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Right. It's right. All relative. Right. It's all relative. And then, you know, the interesting thing is the other thing I noticed was in our area, when anybody is asking for anybody that can help with a 1031 tax exchange, everybody in the market is like Bill Haran, Bill Haran, Bill Haran, Bill Haran. And I'm like, Dude, this guy's got like all of the mind share of the market. Like, how the heck did that happen? Right. And you and I were having lunch a little bit and you were giving me kind of like the history of it. So let's talk a little bit about that, because I've never seen ever anybody else have like such a big portion of the, the mind share of the real estate investor agent market as you have here in the Northern Virginia, D.C. metro area. So you, you don't remember, Rob, but I had poked at you to come out to your uh, monthly meetings in Reston, you know, and you were on a schedule and all that sort of stuff. And you're like, no, 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 no. And then finally I got in, you finally let me in to do a presentation. So That's I hit right. your radar. 100%. <laughs> that was a while ago. Right? Long ago. time ago, man. <laughs> but you, but you said that what you guys really built this business on was education. Absolutely. Right. So right. How, how did your dad start that ethos and like, so, you know, he, uh, as when he was a comptroller in the, in the military, he did some uh, education stuff for accounting and things as he was a comptroller. And then when he went into the real estate business, he worked for Nyrie down in Tyson's. And you remember mm -hmm. Nyrie was the big school that everybody went and got their principals at and all that sort of stuff. So he was, oh, he was teaching investment stuff. And then he started teaching 1031 stuff because as it was coming out, it was all brand new. And so his focus was always real estate and teaching, right? And he learned very quickly that if you stand up there and be the expert, 
which he was, then people call you and mm -hmm. they want to do business with you. And so uh, I learned that very quickly. My, I was always skeptical. I'd be, wait a minute, you're teaching everybody all this stuff. They don't need you. Uh, that's not the case at all. They want the education. They want to know how to do it and find somebody that does it every day, right? Not just talk about it, but actually mm -hmm. does it. And mm -hmm. so that's what we focused on. So I've followed through with that. And so we teach, uh, we have our own Virginia school. I have my own 1031 classes up under the Virginia school. So I teach uh, for GCAR, Greater Capillary Association of Realtors, right? Montgomery and DC. I've been teaching for them for the years. I'm, I'm going to teach for their Realtor Fest, which is their um, um, annual meeting here coming up. And uh, I've te I teach in DC. Uh, we just joined NVAR, or joined, I've been a member of NVAR forever, but I've just got on their teaching platform, mm -hmm. and uh, we teach all over the place for 1031 exchanges, so um, that works for us, and, 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 the, and the agents are critical to this process because they know what somebody's doing. Mm -hmm. They're the first ones to know about a transaction, mm -hmm. so I need to be at that first point of touch, right? Yeah, and to guide them just to, to have enough of enough knowledge to be able to say, you know what, this is a, kind of what you need to do, but you really need to talk to, to Billy. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. right. Bring on a team member. That's exactly right. So let's that's let's right. go let's go back in time, right? Like currently or over the last couple of years, you guys have been doing hundreds of, of, of transactions every single month. Um, but in 2008, 2009, like those were difficult times, I, I believe you'd said in the business, right? What did, what did the business look like prior to that? Let's say in 2005, 2006, because that was also the run up, right? 2005, 2006. Yeah. And then, and then what happened? Like kind of walk me through, because you would have been. the phone stopped ringing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. So was it, was it, what, when did it stop ringing? Was it 07? Was it 08? Was it 06? When did you start noticing that? We tipped over August of 05. That's, that was our peak. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah. And um, I think we had done 150 something exchanges that much, which was a peak for us. You got to remember that was fax machines and all that stuff back then. Right. So it was all paper based. Was and that monthly or was that? For, that was a peak for the month. Oh, the peak for, okay. Right. And um, then it tipped and it just kept tipping. And I think we, our worst month was two exchanges. Oh my God. Oh my God is right. Right. And so I ate a lot of peanut butter and stuff like that. So I, That, that, well, the scary times, right? What was going through your mind? There was nothing that here. Absolutely. There yeah. was nothing here. We had to just keep plugging away at it. Yeah. What kept you? What kept you going? I'm curious, right? So, like, there's so there's just what what kept you going? Well, the business was you know 10 years old already, right? 12 years mm -hmm. old already. So we had that in place, and we knew it wasn't going to last forever. Mm -hmm. And so we just kept plugging away, dipped into savings, you know, the whole thing, and kept going on the thing, and um, muscled our way through it. Well, did you, you know, did you have to get super lean? Did it just add oh, two yeah. people, right? Did you get rid of everybody? It's like. Ann and I were left. Yeah. 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 I mean, sitting here you, twiddling our thumbs. Jeff, do you remember those days? Were you? Were I you... do. <laughs> I do. You know, I remember uh, dad getting frustrated at, at the kitchen table one time because he got a phone call and it was just one of those other calls that today we get a hundred of them right of someone having the wrong idea about whether they can do a 1031 exchange right they can do it on their personal house or something and then him just seeing the frustration he has to turn somebody away right because every lead counted at that point yeah so, I remember those lean times it's just the, the everything everything mattered then right uh and it was a uh, different yeah point. Yeah, yeah. I was willing to do an exchange for free, and only if they completed their exchange would they pay me. I was at that point. So. Of course, yeah. I just gotta figure it out, right? It's like, how do we survive? So, when did you start seeing it come back? So it's probably 10, 2010, I think, was when it started to come back. Right. So, so it was. It's, so it was this. It was this. Uh, 
peak. got over the peak in August of 05. Right. And then it was kind of like this slow decline, right? right? And then was there maybe 07 where it felt like it just got completely shut off? Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I could go back and look at the – I don't want to. Those are Yeah, I know. Those are – well, you know, it's so interesting because – uh, Jeff, you don't know this, but I, I started a, a recruiting business with my best friend when I was uh, pretty much right out of college. I was 24. Um, we were placing technical salespeople. This was in 98. So I never knew anything but an upmark, right? 98, 99, 2000. This is like the go-go days of dot-com. Very similar to kind of what you see a lot with crypto right now with like the Lunas. And like People are just getting so much money. And um and 9-11 happened we started seeing a slowdown and then literally 2002 i felt like somebody just turned off the water completely turned it off and we whittled down the three partners there was three of us and we did the whole thing where it was like you know we survived on i mean we got super lean credit lines went into debt a little bit and and navigated that storm and in 05, so when we built it back up, 02, 03, 04, 05, by 05, we were stable again. But by that time, I was like, I was weary. I was battle weary. I was like exhausted. And what had actually gotten me through that downturn was real estate. Real estate was on a rise. And I had been buying property along the way, luckily. And if I needed a prop, if I needed some money, I would sell an asset and it would help fund you know, my family for a little bit. Um, and I fell in love with, with real estate during that time. In fact, Bill, I always have this, this, this discussion with everybody. I also felt like the peak was August of 05. Yeah. Right. But everybody's like, no, it was 07. I was like, no, it wasn't like I saw a peak in 05 in our area. Right. Yep. And then it just was this gradual go down. Right. right. And, um, and, and guess when I started, um, when I started real estate full time, was the summer of 05. Oh, of course. Of course, right, full time. <laughs> but I, but I went in with my eyes. Wide. I told my wife, I was like, "Listen, we're going to go through some kind of recession," but I, I, I had no idea how bad it was right. going to be. Right? We right. just knew that there was going to be a recession. I didn't know how bad it was going to be. I, I said to her, "If we can make it through, like we're going to be able to be come out on the other side super well." Because I saw what happened in, in technology. Um, but that's how I knew it was the summer of 05, because I remember looking around and saying, well, that house has been on the market 13 days. And, you know, just a month, two months ago, it would have been, it would have been under contract in, in a weekend, which, right. you know, I have a little PTSD going on right now because it feels the same way. Right. Although we know that the underlying loans are different today right. than they were right. before. So I'm curious as somebody who's weathered probably a storm or two in your business, Right. What are you guys thinking? What are you guys saying amongst yourselves? Right. Um, what do you what's your crystal ball telling you? <laughs> um, I, I think I mean, I'm reading like everybody else is trying to figure this out. I think because the fundamentals are still strong labor market is still good we don't see the big waves of you know everybody shutting down like crazy and oh, i don't see price drops on properties yet mm -hmm. right when when the actual street price drops i know people are selling they're gonna have to back off from the high numbers that they were getting before but everybody mm -hmm. has been stretching right to mm -hmm. push numbers up and the lending isn't out of whack. I don't think we see any really loosey goosey on the lending like before. Mm -hmm. So people have skin in the game on these things. And so those fundamentals, um, I think will cause the market to run flat for a while, right? Obviously with mortgage sure. rates climbing, you're gonna take a bunch of people out of the business. And then the numbers change, right? When you go to buy something, you got carrying costs are gonna be much higher if you're borrowing money. So it's gonna change the dynamics on all that. Mm -hmm. But there's so much equity built up in these properties now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think those numbers are going to, mostly because people are working. The, if we start seeing businesses really sh shutter, right, and start laying people off, it, that'll ripple through everything, right? Yeah, for sure. Like just the fundamentals are still very, very strong. We're forecasting to run flat for a while. 
Yeah. That's our internal forecasting. But we're rubbing the crystal ball like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know real estate is a leading indicator when they do that, but they're doing this on purpose. They have to, to tame inflation. They don't have much choice to do this, to slow us down because you can't run 20% growth in one year. That just, that's not right. So, so Jeff, welcome to the business. I know. Right. <laughs> we've had that conversation, right? <laughs> well, timing wise, good timing. Right. Right. But, but no, but this is, I, I, I will tell you, this is the best timing, right? Uh, it, it reminds me of, you know, when I went into the business, I'm like, if you, you start thinking strategically, you start looking at things that maybe, you know, we were just doing inefficiently before we're spending money on things we went, shouldn't have been spending money on. Right. Um, I'm just curious, what have you, what have you been tasked with? Right. What's Bill said, Hey, this is, this is what you've been tasked with now, uh, as you, you're starting in the business. Uh, it's, it's a lot more inward focusing the efficiency, right? So as much as, you know, you know, he's done a fantastic job building up the process for us to, you know, efficiently go from, you know, paper transactions, right? Where that, that's how they were handling the hundred transactions. Now it's all online, right? So we're mm -hmm. not in the cloud, but we certainly have our own internal tools to basically automatically do one of these. And that's how we can handle the load we can, right? So, but there's can always do more, right? So now we're looking into the next generation of how do we, how do we do take that next step, both technology wise and process wise to drive further efficiency, right? So then we can, we're ready for whenever this thing rebounds again, right? And so obviously then watching all the market fundamentals as well. Um, but it's that, it's that next transformation, right? What does, what does realty exchange need to look like in two years, five years and beyond, right? How do we, how do we make sure it goes to the fourth generation, right? If we can. Um, with, That's awesome. We need to do yeah and and the other piece is you know we haven't really done any marketing in the last two and a half years right because we're mm -hmm. one of the lucky ones that came out of COVID and took off you know we count our stars and so we're refreshing all of the marketing stuff that we did before because it hasn't been touched in a while we we're just mm -hmm. so, so damn busy we didn't have to cycles mm -hmm. and that's what got us here in the first place we're going back to fundamentals education good material refresh it all right yeah, and build relationships, reach out to people again, like have those conversations, educate them, more classes. Absolutely. Right? And now we have even more tools to do that, right? The Zoom classes, Teams, whatever tools we need to bring in anybody from anywhere. So, yeah. And you guys can do exchanges where? Like all over all the over, U.S.? It's, it's federal. So federal. we can do exchanges. Yeah. Yeah, the oh bulk God. of our the bulk awesome. of our activity is mid Atlantic because that's where I spent all my marketing time. We do a lot in the Outer Banks, right? Because the money is here in the Washington D.C. area, but the um, the properties are in the a lot of rentals at the beaches, right? Ocean City, Bethany, all that sort of stuff. So, it is always interesting to hear clients call from California and then you get a spin them and go, "How did you hear about us?" Right? How right. Did it, but it, it's a surprising amount of them, right? It says we can do it all across the country. Well, as a as a as a business person that is pretty cool that you are not bound by geography and that with the right leaders and the right locations or the right marketing or the right funnels like this business can get really 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 big jeff right he's like bill's probably saying like okay this thing could get really big right with especially with technology like this now allows us to do yeah, you know, a realtor at the ground level still has to go show the house for the most part, right? Right, right. Um, but it sounds like you guys can just do this with anybody all over the country. Right. Educate them and right. then do your exchange. You know, I'm an old man, so I still like the belly to belly stuff to go interact with somebody in a class, right? I like that. But just the logistics of doing that, it just takes many, many hours out of your day to get there figure out all the, the hiccups that you're going to run into versus fire this thing up and go. It's just everything. It's it's another tool, big, big tool. Do we still need to create a TikTok dance. We're working on, working on that. That's right. You're going to. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about how do you up, right? Like your social media game, especially with what you guys have, right? Your social, like it's all about getting your, visibility in front of all the agents and the investors that are out there and, and you know they're on tiktok all the time jeff now like doing their damn dances so if you could somehow target them yeah it'd be pretty cool right you can figure that out right <laughs> i know 
<laughs> Jeff, what did you do before this? So I took a somewhat similar path. I actually went into technology as well. So I ended up being a kind of a, not quite a technical sales rep, but I was a, a pre-sales, right? So, sure. I, and so most recently, I actually just left Dell. So I was at Dell for, uh, you know, we got acquired a couple times, the original company I joined, but it had been about 10 years. So it had been 10 years this August. Uh, yeah, next month, uh, if I had stayed. So I spent about nine years in technology doing sales and, you know, working in servers, technology server storage, all that kind of stuff. So that, that those fundamentals of working with large companies and being able to get on the phone, talk to clients, understand, you know, pain points, that kind of thing. It actually, it helps a lot to be able to transition to something new because I'm learning all the legal stuff now, right? All the new concepts and how to talk about things and, you know, learning what a private letter ruling is from the IRS, all kinds of stuff like that. But I, I can still get on the phone and be comfortable, right? At least comfortable enough to go ask dad if I uh, need help. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's that's awesome. Okay, well, you 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 went through 2008, like literally, it was crazy for you guys there for a few years. It took three or four years, five years, it sounded like to really kind of come back, right? Right. Um, and then it got steady again. And then it got crazy good for you guys over the last couple of years, probably to the point where you were like, I just need a little bit of a break, or you needed more people or more band. Probably people was probably the hardest you know, thing that you had to deal with the last couple of years. Yeah, we right? doubled. We doubled in size and staff. Wow. Yeah. Okay. In the last two and a half years. Yeah. So, you know, we dipped for two months during the worst of COVID and then just took off after that. Okay. We've been running pretty hard. And so now uh, it sounds like you, you're, you're kind of projecting flat. You want to make sure that you guys are well protected, insulated. Jeff, you've been brought in to help kind of, you know, obviously continue to expand this business right? All the rest. What, what advice would you guys give those that, that are in, that have never seen this bill, right? Just a, a shift uh, in the market. What advice would you give people that are building their businesses through these kind of times, right? When there's uncertainty, like, how do you, how do you run the ship? For me, it's fundamentals. Go back to the basics, right? Mm -hmm. What got me here in the first place was just banging away at it. And, you know, education and all that was fundamentals to us, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have the knowledge, somebody else wants it, right? And it's valuable. And then share it freely. Right? That's my, it's just like you do, man. You share mm -hmm. it freely, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's an important piece to the puzzle. It's fundamentals. You know, it's interesting. I, I had a... Um... I had breakfast with this guy that sold, uh, he's started in our business, uh, like as an agent and then he built many teams and technology and all the rest. And, uh, and I was saying, you know, over the last 10 years, like he had like this kind of like this meteoric rise, like how did that come about? He said, you know, people forget that I spent 10 years of just freely giving information away and building a brand of trust. And and um, and that's kind of the key that I'm hearing you say, right? It's like it, you want to build trust with people, and the way you build trust with people is to show them that you know what you're doing, and you give the information away freely. Right. And then right. people say, "Hey, I want to I want to work with them." Okay. So go. And, on. You know, another piece to the puzzle. I'm very actively involved in the industry itself. Hmm. So that would be another piece of advice: get involved in your local realtor associations and know the know the details that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis because when you talk to a client and you talk about things you know about because you're plugged in you're an expert in a hurry right so i focus our national association of qi companies like us is called fea federation of exchange accommodators so i got myself pretty well plugged into that you know past president sat on the board for years but that introduced me to all the players across the country, all the national players across the country. Mm. And so that's Running a big the, deal, both in the legal world, which is its own world into itself, much mm -hmm. less the QI business, the business owners, two different worlds, but we run together. What are, now that I think about it, what are the biggest threats for you guys, right? Is it, is it laws getting changed? Is it, uh, I remember before you you had talked about you lobbying on the hill for something 
Like, yeah, what, that's what? our biggest threat is is Congress. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You know, we only exist because of it, hmm. because of the law. And so um, we work pretty diligently to make sure that the members on the Hill know what this stuff is and how powerful it is in the economy. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yes, I spent a, in 2017, um, well, I spent an awful lot of time on Capitol Hill. I was up there just about every 30 days walking the halls, you know, chasing members around to make sure they knew what this stuff was all about. And we were successful in protecting 1031. It was a close call. It was mm. a close call. So um, I met just about every one of them that you can think about, you know, so <laughs> chewed on their ears about leave 1031 alone. That's our simple message. You know, it's, it's a good thing. Leave it alone. It is a good thing. It's a great <laughs> thing, right? Well, what do you, are, are there any other foreseeable, not just 1031s, but are there any other like, laws that you see coming down the pike that might also benefit investors, right? That might benefit investors? Benefit no. from a tax perspective. Not that I'm aware of. Nothing that I'm tracking okay. at this moment in time. Um, you know, we're we're rubbing our crystal ball and we're forecasting at least a flip of one of the houses on the hill. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to divided government, um, it'll 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 go it won't get much done. Got it. Right. They'll pass their budgets and stuff like that. But law stuff, the real threat comes when one party controls all three branches. Mm -hmm. That's where the threat is. Either R's or D's, it doesn't matter because they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And, and there's no hold back to it. And so um, I, you know, we're predicting a, a change in at least one of the chambers and that'll go cold. That'll put us cold. Then we go through the next presidential cycle, all that stuff. So we got many years to go before we re a big time threat. Sometimes it'll come out of nowhere. So for example, you know, uh, President Biden had proposed a half a million dollar deferral um, uh, on per person. So that's not a 1031 threat. It just puts cold water on, on uh, exchanges, right? Because the big guys will find something else to do with an exchange mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. the, the smaller players. So it, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Or they'll change some archaic tax thing that has nothing to do with 10 through one, but it'll ripple through everything. We're watching that very closely. Interesting. You just made me, as you were saying that I saw, I, I had this kind of like this vision, right? I don't know why kind of pop in my head of your dad giving you advice as you kind of took over the reins of the business and and then maybe at some point the advice that you're going to give Jeff, right, as that kind of happens. Like, what did your dad tell you? I'm curious. Um, mostly it was learn what the investor is going through so that you have empathy as to what the heck they're going through, right? Mm. They're managing some property and all the headaches that come along with it. And I, I've been an investor, so I've owned property. So I have that fundamentals but also understand the math because you're running a property on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, dealing with all the issues, but then you also got to do the tax part of it. That mm -hmm. gets complicated. So his fundamental, you got to learn this stuff. Well, you better learn it if you're going to teach it. And so you got, I had to go through all that learning process to absorb all this stuff and then how it's all interconnected with each other. So mm -hmm. I had the full picture of what an investor is going through, right. And making these decisions. So it's it's the fundamentals. I mean, you got to know the fundamentals. And, you know, the 1031 world is weird because it's legal stuff, contracts, all that sort of stuff. It's tax. And then it's the exchange laws by themselves. So I got all three of those components that make a transaction. So it's sort of hmm. a little bit unique. You know, it's and you never assume anything because I've talked to big time attorneys that you would assume they know what the heck you're talking about. Man, they are in left field. <laughs> they don't know this stuff. Well, I've made that mistake. You use the assume word, you get in trouble, right? Well, you know, I, I would imagine if their attorneys, their brain isn't one hundred percent focused on this, of right? Not. Which is which is the power of a specialization. Like whenever That's I exactly right. Whenever I talk to agents, and how are you going to survive in a market? It's like by getting really good at one thing, right? Yeah. Whether you're the agent investor or you're the waterfront property guy or you're the neighborhood expert like 
like got to get good at something, become the authority there. Right. I totally agree, man. That's the niche. You got to find that niche, man, that specialty. Yeah. Absolutely. Something, something that resonates with you, right? Something that you're like, okay, I like this niche because of this. Right. right. Um, so I guess you would probably give Jeff then the same advice. Hey, empathize with that investor, what they're going through, challenges that they're facing. Yeah, I, I'm curious, what would you say to the investor who, I was talking to this one investor not too long ago. He has six or seven properties and he's trying to figure out what to do with them. And 1031 is certainly an option. And, you know, um, but he's like, man, if I sell them, like paying all the recapture on everything. He's like, I literally 50% of all of my equity just goes back in like the, all the, the recapture. Like what, what's typically your conversation with somebody like that, right? I, obviously there's a lot to it. You'd have to know more about, you know, you're not giving them uh, advice on, I would imagine you're not going to give them any kind of like financial advice, but you know, you need to give them the information that empowers them with, with maybe some different options that might be available that they weren't even thinking about. Right. 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 Yeah. I think the many of our clients don't understand the tax impact when they sell. Right. So they go, I'm going to sell, but they don't really know what that tax number is. And I'm telling you that drives a lot of decisions. You know, if it's $2 in tax, ah, dump it, be done with it. But when it gets up into 50, 60, you know, 100 grand of tax that you got to write a check for, it dry, that focuses your mind pretty clearly. And then that's part of the education part. What can you buy? What can you replace this with? What is your plan? Right. So, you know, I had a client that sold a um, pretty large residential up here and he bought several smaller dollar properties, rental properties down near Fort Myer. Mm -hmm. And that's where he was going to retire. So he started moving his investment south and then he was going to retire down there. He's headed for Florida because it's a zero income tax state. You know, it's all mm -hmm. part of this plan or his thought process. But he took one investment that had all this gain built up into it and broke it up into multiple. Mm -hmm. When he needed money, he'd sell one, just like you were saying. I'd sell one and get some cash. Well, because it wasn't one big sale and they take a big old chunk, he spread it out among multiple tiny dollar properties mm -hmm. and then just you know when he needed money he sold that one and so you know he got rid of 5.75 of virginia tax right off the top mm. he, was, he was ahead of the game and he was a handyman so he didn't mind babysitting properties right mm -hmm. and then you know part of what we run into now is a lot of our the old people own all the real estate they're the ones that made all the money, but they're also mm -hmm. tired, right? They don't mm -hmm. want to be the landlord anymore. I'm sick of that. So we see these, what's called Delaware Statutory Trust. So it's a whole market out there. It's a billion dollar space. It's not a small space where sponsors own commercial property of all kinds of flavors. And then they sell interests in those buildings. Mm -hmm. And that's just one more replacement type of replacement property you can go into. There's limitations on them. They're not liquid, et cetera, et cetera. And you're out of control. You put your money in, you get, you get a pray that the sponsor, the guy running the project is knows what they're doing. But it's one of those pieces because we have clients that want to downsize. You know, I own the big old house, but I don't want that big of a house when I go buy the new one. But I got to replace the full value of the one I'm giving up. So they'll fill up with a DST. So they go mm -hmm. buy what they want as a smaller dollar one. That's what that fits what they want. And then fill up with something else, a DS, a different kind of an investment. Yeah. Somebody but can strategy wise, it's all over the map. Yeah. I had a client of mine. She she ended up uh, investing in Jiffy Lubes. Yeah. Right? Like, right. Yep. That that was that was one. Um and yeah, then she was nervous about it because the leases on those were coming up, right, right. in a certain amount of time frame. So then she said That's it the wasn't commercial world, which is a whole different set of, you know. Ooh, yeah, she's uh, like it wasn't as back. it wasn't as hands off as I would have thought it would have been because now I'm worried about what happens. Is this going to get re-upped, right? right. What's the value right. of that asset? So, right. um, yeah, I think I for those on here listening. Bill said something that I, I, I think um, we should all be really paying attention to, right? It's like all, like there's a lot of older people that own a lot of real estate, right? And they're, and they are tired. 
and they are trying to figure out what are next steps for them and they don't want to manage them and offering them solutions can often help them right and and some of them might decide to sell one or two of the assets right and maybe you can buy one or two of those some might own or finance i don't know if you run into that you know at all bill where people just decide you know what why why don't i just own or finance the asset versus selling it do, do you ever get that do you, so yeah. You know, they don't need us if it's a full owner financing, but when they want to do an exchange and not pay the tax on it, sure. Yeah, we'll, we bring notes into escrow, stuff like that. There's a mechanism to deal with that. So it really depends on what's going on, uh, whether they want to continue to own real estate, but yet offer owner financing for the buyer, right, to make the deal happen. So it depends on what's going on. If they just want to cash out and don't own any more real estate, owner financing is one of those things. It's a delay in getting your money, so you pay your taxes when the principal's paid off. So you yeah, know, you loan somebody ten uh, on a ten-year note, interest only, and then they pay you off in year ten. That's when you pay your taxes because you got your money. Could you do it? I guess incrementally. To sure. Pay, sure. Right? Sure. Whatever you negotiate in the note, right? When you yeah. get your principal's, when you owe your taxes. Yep. Yeah, at the end of the day, I guess you're paying it. You're just paying it at just a different Over time. way. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and people, that's part of the strategy that I hear is, you know, hey, my income is going to drop. So I'm going to drop these payments that are inbound to me in a, A, I'm moving to Florida. So now the money's coming to me in Florida. And then B, you know, I'm in a lower bracket. Mm -hmm. so this money coming to me is in a, in a lower bracket. So that's all part of that thought process planning for clients in the future. When do I get this income? So that's interesting. Then, then really, I'm just trying to think strategically for you guys, right? Because you said you work with a, a lot of where, where was it? Bethany Beach, is that right? Outer Banks. Like, Outer a Banks. Lot the Outer Banks. Yep. Right. But then I would imagine there'd be a lot of people that here that, that you would start paying attention to migration patterns. I, I started seeing a lot of people moving to Florida, right, during COVID. Um, is that something that you guys? somehow focus on pay attention I don't, to no nope, no nope. there was enough going on with mm -hmm. just playing you know sales happening people moving stuff around so no i wasn't focused on where they were going for some reason a lot of money went to south carolina i don't know why but man, it hit my radar yeah of all places right south something carolina. must have been going on there yeah down near the beaches right which well, that would be interesting, right? <clears throat> Just you guys developing relationships with agents down in those markets, South Carolina and Florida, because sometimes what will happen is people will start inquiring before they make any decisions, right? And they'll meet with a realtor down in South Carolina or Florida. They do a little window shopping and they're like, I want to do this. And now they need a vehicle, right? They need, they need somebody to educate them about 1031 tax exchange. So I'm just, right. okay. Yeah, cool. great. Yeah, no, those are those are places we don't necessarily focus, but that we find that all the time is, you know, it doesn't matter where the realtor is, it the realtor is usually the first point of contact, right? To get to get a, get a referral. So we've we found that before. Realtors that are people who are moving from, say, the West Coast to the East Coast. And then that's how we touch those West Coast people is through the realtor here on the East Coast. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, I think you guys are in an awesome business, right? Like the more I think about it in my in my brain about um, how you can go across states. You don't need, it's a one, do you need a license for it? You don't need a license. You just need the knowledge to have it. Yeah, right? we had, as part of our lobbying, we had asked uh, the Commerce Department to regulate us. Mm -hmm. And they told us, no, you're too small. So, which is weird, an industry <laughs> asking to be regulated. <laughs> they don't go away. That is interesting. That is interesting. Okay, so uh, this is now a multi-generation uh, generational business, right? I'm sure that kind of business has its own unique challenges, right? Um, no, I don't have any challenges. What do you no ch about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. I might I'm just be like to get the phone to work. Man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. What What are some of the challenges, right? You own, own a family business, I would imagine. There's challenges that are different above it. Like my wife and I, right? Well, actually, my wife is now, I've retired her, right? But she and I pretty much started the business. Man, like for the first eight or nine years, it was like every night we're talking about P&Ls. That, right. that was a challenge, right? That was a, hey, baby, is there something, some other kind of pillow talk besides talking about the P&L? And did you send such and such the email? I was like, oh, yeah, there's, 
you got to learn how to create some boundaries in a, in a family owned business, right? I don't know if you have any words of wisdom around that, or maybe you guys are just learning that as you go. Through. We don't have any challenges. Do we have any challenges, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> it's always been all in my head. Now I get yeah. to push it into, I got to take 20 years and stick it in his head. Trying to absorb the fire hose still at my face right now. So maybe in, you know, call me in a year and it'll be a lot of, hey, come on, we'll uh, let's talk about something else. You got you to gotta get all of those things recorded. That's true. Yeah. You, you should do some kind of like this, right? And record yeah bite size because i mean 20 years of knowledge right it seen everything yeah 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 tell you everything well guys hey i appreciate your time right i appreciate your time learning a little bit about your business um if anybody in the grid family is listening in on here now we learned a couple things right like they can do exchanges all over the u.s right they're not restricted by geography and you might have clients that need solutions to complex problems and bill could probably and jeff could probably give you some guidance some advice on what they've seen right other people do along the way and i i would imagine you might be open to taking some of those calls now and just getting some advice you know just giving people advice right we might even do a, a 1031 tax exchange class as part of our grid ai uh, training that we're putting out there for agents because I think that might be really, really valuable. I'm going to talk to Jessica about that. Be yeah, great. it's a critical tool for agents. I, I don't know how many you know agents I've talked to because they had gone to a class, at least they understood the basics, they could help craft a plan for a client. Because when a client has a giant tax bill, they freeze, right? Mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm selling and I have to pay all that money, I'm not doing anything. We call that the lock-in effect. That tax bill is locking them up. But if you can help a client with a plan, a path to go forward, hey, trade this one for this one, and then, hey, maybe buy into a DST or, or something to help them, then it works, right? Then, then you're part of the solution to move a property. Otherwise, they're going to sit. They're going to lock up, right? Okay, Bill, Jeff, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to make it a reality. We're going to do a how-to class for Grid AI. I'll make it as bonus content, right? Grid AI is our agent investor a uh, platform that we just launched for the agents that want to learn the investment game and work with investors and be them their investors themselves. We'll do a how to spend maybe 40 minutes to an hour. If that's cool with you, we'll record something like this. And um, you and should actually come to my class. Rob. When is the class? When's uh, the class? Yeah. When's yep. the class? I'm happy to come to the class. Right. Or, or, you know, let's bring the classroom to you, <laughs> right? We'll bring the classroom to you. Deal. Okay, guys, I appreciate your time. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Nice to Thanks meet everybody. Yeah. Take care, Jeff.